Thank you, Carl Eric, for those two kind words. And thank you, Institute for Cultural Diplomacy and Mark Donfried, for inviting me here. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to, to speak. I mean, as we see a cultural diplomacy as a kind of interface between culture and diplomacy, I come from the cultural side. I must stress this uh, because I am not a scholar like the distinguished speakers some minutes ago, but I'm an artist in the bottom and, and also been teaching, of course. But um, back in 2001, I had the privilege of being invited to conduct a mini opera, long forgotten. This opera was written by a famous Italian Baroque composer, Stradella. I don't know if you've heard about him, but he's between the more famous composers, Monteverdi and Corelli. And uh, the period is 1676 around. And no less than Queen Christine of Sweden, who I will speak about then, had given him the commission. She was then living as a queen without land in Rome, having uh, abdicated the Swedish throne. And uh, as I said, this opera had never been performed because through wars and, and, and the history, the libretto, the book with the text, had been separated from the music. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we can put on the first uh, picture of Queen Christina, number one. Yes, so we see of whom I'm talking. There she is. Uh, I then was sent the manuscript and the music. It had never been performed. And uh, I was asked if I was willing to conduct this. And I read the music, I read the text, and I was fascinated. I was fascinated because her scripture, her instructions to the singers and to the musicians were so modern and so accurate. I couldn't believe that this was a queen 350 years ago. And since then, my fascination for this exceptional lady has never stopped. And uh, a few years after, a French member of the Fran French Academy approached me. He was writing a book about Reine Christine et la musique. And he wanted us to start a European project with culture, because Europe facing so many crises now, as you know, has to do with freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and that is nothing new. Queen Christina was the most famous woman of her century, and she faced the same crisis. So that's the reason why I started to work with Queen Christina as a musician, but then more and more working with uh, the topics that are close to human rights, freedom of religion, etc. And I suppose you don't know very much about Queen Christina. And since now, eight or nine or even 10 countries in Europe are working to promote her as an emblem of European identity. I will start this, this little speech with a short background and, and about Queen Christina. Europe was ravaged by political and religious conflicts when Christina of Sweden born in 1626, dead in 1689, grew up. At the age of six, she witnessed the funeral of her father, Gustavus Adolphus, fallen on the battlefield in Germany in Lützen as commander of the Protestant armies in the Thirty Years' War against the Catholics. Christina was the only heir to the throne of Sweden, at that time a great power including Finland, Estonia, Latvia, and parts of today's Lithuania, Germany, and Russia. So practically all the Baltic Sea was part of Sweden at those days. Christina was raised as a future king, dressed, hunted, and rode horses like a man. She was a very intelligent and gifted student as a young girl, eagerly learning history, religion, sciences, she spoke fluently eight languages. Imposing her will on the then powerful Chancellor Axel Oxenschana, who was one of the great diplomatic masters of the 17th century, the young queen ended the terrible Thirty Years' War by signing the Westphalian Peace Treaties in 1648. I'll come back to this later. She, the queen, founded hospitals, schools, and universities in her territories 
and invited artists and famous scholars to her dynamic court in Stockholm. I will also come back to this. In 1654, when she was 28, however, on top of power and fame, Christina shocked her subjects and the whole of Europe by abdicating from the Swedish throne, going into exile, and then later, a year later, converting to Catholicism. You can imagine the shock. Her father was dead for the cause of Protestant, and she converts to Catholicism in Innsbruck. During 18 months, she traveled extensively, greeted as a queen of peace all over in Europe, in Hamburg, Antwerp, Brussels, Innsbruck, Spoleto, and other cities. When she entered Rome, a triumph arc was constructed for her. It's one of the images. I think this one is running without my influencing it. So here's the arc. When she came to Rome, this was constructed for her. But I have no influence. Again, I will have to comment these pictures later. The most, uh, her destination was Rome, as I said, where Pope Alexander VII welcomed her in 1655 with magnificent processions and ceremonies. She was the most prominent European woman of the 17th century, mainly devoted then her new life to the arts and sciences, although she still pursued political ambitions. Christina upheld a huge correspondence founded academies and was a patron of the arts. Bernini and Cil Corelli dedicated immortal works to her. I'll come back to this later. She received a sovereign's burial in St. Peter's Basilica, also one of the images here. Since then, her influence and fascination has never faded. New books about her appear every year in all over the world, from New Zealand to Chile. Even movies and operas are coming out every year. I saw the first uh, premiere of a new movie uh, by Kauris a well-known Finnish art, uh, film director last year, The Girl King. Uh, it's not too good, but you can see it anyhow. <laughs> what can citizens of modern Europe learn from this remarkable woman? A century before Diderot and Voltaire, she advocated enlightenment, tolerance, peaceful coexistence and equality. She refused to accept the traditional feminine role of the 17th century. Her complex life and destiny show us how cultural values in the end are stronger than armies. She transcended divisions of nations, religions and cultures. She embodied European integration 300 years before the European, setting an indisputable indisputable example of European identity. She is called the prototype of the modern woman. So this was a little bit the introduction to the queen herself. Now this is running wild, so you can look at that if, and we can you know, share the picture and the text. What was then the interface between culture and diplomacy? A young queen educated as a king was from childhood very much into diplomacy, All, already through the body language. There was a ceremonial, an etiquette. They had to move in a certain way. As, as late as yesterday, I saw a picture in the television where the, the new intended uh, Secretary of State of uh, President Trump was visiting uh, Kreml a couple of years ago, and you saw him and Putin taking the front chairs, and their surroundings took the smaller chairs back behind them. This is exactly the same way as was done in all royal courts when young Christina was a queen. She was moving in a certain way. She was trained in, in dance, in ballet, and how to speak and how to keep your head, where to turn your your uh, profile and were it to look straight, you know. This is part of the etiquette, part of the diplomacy. Uh, she danced herself. Uh, that was part also of, of, of the, the language between strategies in the society and meeting between representatives of different uh, nations. When she used her influence as a young queen, against 
the will of the powerful royal council at Sweden. Don't forget that she was only six when she was, became a queen, and gradually with her education, she was prepared to take over at her majority. She did this, and it was an absolute sovereign, and she opposed the continuation of the war, although in 1648, the Swedish armies were at the top of their successes, military spoken. They took Prague with enormous cultural boot. And the, the deceased Emperor Rudolf had chosen Prague as his capital. So the Swedish cultural boot contained more than 900 fantastic paintings. Many of them are still in Sweden. A third of them she took with her when she abdicated. I will come back to that later because this is also a, a connection between culture and diplomacy. Anyhow, she used her influence as a sovereign to direct the delegates of Sweden in this country, the 30 wars, as you may know, was a German war, although it is called World War Zero. Why is it called that? Because all continental states of Europe, except England and Russia, and maybe one other, were participating in the war. It started out in 1618 as a religious war, and it ended 30 years, of course, later as a great power war. Because meantime, France, Catholic country, had joined Sweden against another Catholic power, Habsburg, and the imperial, the, the, the emperor of, of Habsburg, who united Holland, Belgium, Austria, Spain. So France was an emergent great power, didn't want Habsburg to become too powerful, and they placed a lot of subventions in the Swedish court to fight this war. So finally, she was tired of this very cruel war going on in this country, and for five or four or five, six years, negotiations were going on in Osnabrück and Münster, two towns of Westphalia. That's the name of the peace treaties. And actually, it ended the war through her active participation. She ordered the Swedish delegates, although there was an ongoing uh, war, you know, from daily reports from other wars today where we live, that the side who is very successful has no intention to stop the war. This is a sad story that is as old as the Bible or older. Anyhow, she instructed the, the delegates to stop the war and to accept, make a good war. And uh, this created a new order in Europe, because as I said, all countries were participating. And the Westphalian peace is, is called the example of a good peace treaties, because it laid the foundation for the new national states in Europe that didn't exist before. Before, a king could be a king one day of Bourgogne or Burdi, next day of Picardy or, or, or a province in Italy. But then the national states were, so to speak, formed and are the basis for today's Europe. I mean, it shifted, of course, through all the wars uh, and the Congress of Vienna. But uh, as late as two years ago, Henry Kissinger, the famous uh, former American State Secretary, wrote a brilliant book about the history of all peace negotiations. I recommend it for you to read. It's called The World Order. And in there, it, it deals with all peace treaties that of, of importance from Alexander the Great until the end of the Vietnam War, which he was an active uh, architect of. And he, Kissinger, says that the Westphalian peace is a model peace. It was a very smart and wise decision that enabled all participant countries to continue to survive after a mega event. We just heard how a lot of focus is on, on a thing that will pass and then disappear. The same thing can be said about wars. They disappear. But how do you construct the future? How do you lay the basements? And I think this is the most important. Mark Ney said the word trust. I think it's very right. The trust is the basis for the future once a war has stopped. And she was very looking forward and very advancing uh, and taking down the interests of Sweden in the interests of the whole Europe. 
So that was concluded, and uh, then suddenly, a couple of years later, this lady, this exceptional lady, in a century where uh, a woman was number two in a family, she could not accept the idea of marrying, because the day she married, she was number two in the couple. And actually, she was, so to speak, uh, fiancée with her cousin, uh, but she withdrew from this by this reason. She was so dominant, she was educated as a free woman and, and as a woman who decided. So she could not accept. She, this, she said, I want to abdicate. I cannot produce hairs to the Swedish throne. You cannot keep me as a queen. So in the dialogue with, with, the, with the parliament, she then finally had a successor, his, her cousin, Charles X, who was ready to take over. And this she achieved when she was 28. She abdicated and went into exile just a few days afterwards. And then she started this trip that I mentioned through Europe. She was hailed all over with ceremonies, with uh, uh, fireworks, operas, theaters, music. She was known. Here we have a picture of her with Descartes. She had invited to her. Uh, well, this is so fast, but uh, I, I can maybe... I can maybe go back. There we have it. There we have it. This. There you see the famous philosopher Descartes to the right. I will stand here and make sure he stays where he is. Uh, and, and she had invited him to her court. And uh, we admit, we Swedes, Karl Erik and I, we have to admit that the only contribution of Sweden to European philosophy is that Descartes died in our capital. <laughs> <clears throat> he died uh, only a few months after his arrival uh, to, because she had the habit of making him come in the cold of the winter at four o'clock to teach her in philosophy. She was up at three and she wanted him to be there at four and he was a French late uh, morning sleeper. So he, he didn't stand that, you know. But he was a brilliant thinker, mathematician, and philosopher. Uh, this was the way she, she introduced ballet, classical music. She hired musicians, uh, artists, architects to her. So she really was into culture. This is very important for the, her uh, future life. She abdicated. And then after all these tra travels, traveling around, here we see her entering Paris. She's greeting. She's greeted here by, by the, the chap in red. I don't know if it's Mazarin or, or the Duc de Condé. Anyhow, it's her with a hat. She's outside Paris being greeted by Louis XIV and his all-powerful uh, chancellor, Ma Mazarin. I, I hope you have heard about him. A great diplomat and very much into culture too. Very actual for this institute. Uh, she was uh, greeted finally in Rome with the Ark, as I told you, by the then Pope. And he, this Pope, Alexander VII, had only been in office for a couple of months. And who was he? He was Alexander Kigi, a diplomat for the Vatican, who had been negotiating the Westphalian peace. So he had lived in Germany for three, four years, negotiating the same peace where she was on the other side. And of course, it was a huge triumph for the Catholic faith that the daughter of the Lion of the North converted to their faith. At that time, you know, it was usually important. Uh, and, but she was also not too religious. She had not been too good a Protestant, and she never became too good a Catholic. Although, although uh, the, the, the spiritual life was intense, and she was very much into it, she was also interested by, by, by philosophy and reason, and she thought that reason is the most important. And that's why she's called uh, Enlightenment 100 years before the Enlightenment. This is also the reason why the French today, modern French philosophers and writers, are dealing with her. And in Italy, where she then stopped, and the reason why she chose to live in Rome the rest of her life, it was more than 30 years, was that no royalty was above her. She was still a queen, a queen without land, but she had the sovereign's rights. And only the Pope 
was and the Pope was anyhow above all kings in Europe at that time. Again, ceremonious cultural diplomacy in a historical context. And there she founded academies. As I told you, she devoted her life to culture. She founded academies for art, music, and philosophy. And the Italians are very proud of her because she founded the first and still the most important academy for the Italian language, Accademia della Arcadia, was founded by her and then was called Accademia Reale, but after her death it was called Arcadia because she chose to put on the written language of uh, Dante, which was called the Arcadian Italian. And she's so important in Italian cultural life that they call the 17th century, you know what? Il secolo della regina, the century of the queen, and no other was than Queen Christina. So this project for which I am now devoting a, a huge share of my time uh, is really finding ways in the history, in our backgrounds, that could serve as an example of unity and identity. Because even if kill, people were killing each other 300 years ago for religion, unfortunately, it's the same today. And we have to do all we can to stop this. It's so useless, and we all here in this room know that this is useless, and the fundamentalism is still surviving somehow. You know. And she was a big advocate of freedom of religion. Once she had converted to Catholicism and was living in Rome, at the moment when Louis XIV, many years later after she had met him, called back the Edict of Nantes, you know what that is? Uh, at the end of Richelieu and, and Louis XIII, the freedom of faith was established in France. The, the Huguenots, the Protestants, and the Catholics were granted the same rights. And many fantastically famous French politicians, Colbert and others, were Protestants. They lived peacefully until Louis XIV came upon the idea, because he was an ardent Catholic, to revoke this and start the persecutions again that had been going on for centuries before the, the beginning of the 17th century. So some, sometime around 1674, he revoked this freedom, and it was punished by the death to be active Protestant. You, know, you can think about it. And then she wrote from Rome, a Catholic queen, former Protestant queen, she wrote letters that vehemently protested against this. She was also protecting Jews in her territories when she was a queen. She was also promoting Jews' right to be in Germany and Holland. And she dealt all her money business and, and arts business were dealt through famous Jewish merchants. So she was very free of speech, free of expression, free of religion was her idea of how people should live with each other. And uh, uh, she also, in the Catholic faith, had contacts with not so uh, mainstream people. Uh, those of you who are acquainted with Brazilian Portuguese uh, literature know about Padre Vieira. He is a very famous figure in Portugal and Brazil. He was a Jesuit who wrote a lot about uh, uh, Brazil and, and religion, and he was a fantastic mind, but he was at the moment of his life persecuted by the Inquisition and banned to Rome. <laughs> he couldn't stay in Portugal, but he was banned to go to Rome and, 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 and stay in, in, in the good surrounding for five years before coming back, nothing worse. And then he became her confessor, and they became great friends, and there is a wonderful exchange of, of letters between the two. And, uh, but he was, as I said, on the index list, but she didn't hesitate to promote it. She opened the first theater, public theater in Rome, and she had a relation with the Cardinal Azzolino, uh, who was a cardinal of, of the Vatican. So she entertained, and she was yet open-minded, which is remarkable. 
So she was a woman of exceptional uh, characters. She had her very dark moments because living as she did, she considered herself to be an absolute monarch and she didn't hesitate to execute a former lover who betrayed not her personally, but her political interests. She was interested in becoming the queen of Na Naples, Napoli, how do you say, Naples? And he, Monaldeschi, betrayed her and he had him executed in the palace of Fontainebleau. This is a dark point in her CV. <laughs> but you have to overcome that. And I think that she's an example uh, of and actually maybe a prototype of modern woman, as she's called. Anyhow, in a century as ours, where so many conflicts are old and so many conflicts are added that are new, we need examples of people who dare go against the stream, who dare brand uh, the reason and the freedom and equality. And she is one of the rare historical examples of uh, significance we have. And uh, I don't know if my time is out, because we have a possibility of showing you two minutes of dance to her honor. All right, but I don't, I don't command that from here. Or do I? I? I have to then have help of your technician. Uh, the, he said that there is, a, there is a video in here that we could show. Uh, Yes. Uh, before we, we leave the place to the dance, uh, I would like to uh, stop with one of the, the quotations that we think important. I don't know if it's verbal from her, but they say that culture merits to be at the center of international politics and diplomacy. I would say this is wrong. I would say culture must be the center of diplomacy and international relations. Thank you. Yeah. But where is Esteban? Where is uh, he is the one? Esteban. Yes. One more time. Yes. Open this slide. There is Okay. So, please, ladies and gentlemen, have your questions and comments. If there are questions, we take them, and then you show the dance. Five minutes. Just cut it after five minutes. No sound. The, the dance from the beginning. Just and you cut it after. Well, uh, I don't know if that's a good sign or very bad sign. There are no questions. I take it as a good sign, and then we then we move on. Yes, that was a question. Yes, yes. Yeah. I did. At least I didn't hear any snoring. So, <laughs> I did, not loud enough. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Yara Mualla, and I'm a PhD student uh, 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 between the ICD and the University of West of Scotland. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Actually, it just reminded me of uh, the, the Arab philosophy of looking at time. The time looks in a spiral way. It's not going into circles, but it's in a spiral way. And in this case, it time, it sometimes it repeats itself. And we can learn a lot from the history as well. Um, uh, I forget to say that I'm from Syria originally. Um, uh, uh, the thing that um, looking at the history and learning something from it, try to apply it to the to the present is something that I really look at in my uh, in my PhD as well because uh, uh, I'm looking at the role of cultural heritage as a tool uh, for bringing peace and making change. Uh, uh, in Syria, uh, so uh, you can see uh, we had a very huge history of tolerance and acceptance and now uh, regardless of all that, that's the first time in history that the Syrians are fighting actually, um, whether we call it civil war, whether we call it uh, other things, uh, in a way there are some Syrians involved in that, and they are killing each other among, uh, upon um, religion or uh, ethnicity or other things. Um, my question is, um, 
in which way we can mobilize the stories of the past, the narrative of the past, uh, to bring people together, to, to really learn um, from the values that we took from that story. So m maybe if you can share your experience. Well, I can only comment from my personal point of view. I think that at the base of uh, violent acts such as a civil war uh, demonstrate, is in education and ignorance about what is religion, what is love, and what is hatred. I think it's as basic as that. As long as you have schools that teach that it's okay to go out and, and, and cut the throats of, of those who believe in other things or think otherwise, as long as you have this mentality being uh, alive in a country with, uh, w with either uh, if you call them priests or imams or whatever you call them, you know, if people are, are allowed to, to, to preach violence and hatred, this will go on because there are always reasons for we and they, you know, creating a big, huge difference line between me and you. This line must be overbridged, less of me and less of you, more of us. And how can we achieve that? I think through education, through culture. Culture is education. That's why I have, I'm father of six kids, and I, I, I am very uh, thinking a lot about what you question. How do we avoid such violence that Syria is the victim of today? Syria, who is the cradle of, of, of universal Western culture. I mean, Palmyra and the uh, rest is older than, than any of the cities we have in this part of the world. And our culture comes from there. How come that this catastrophe can even start? It's a modern phenomenon. It it's, has to do with poverty and richness, all that, yes. But still, if there is no justice in, 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 the, in the repetition of, of, of material welfare, there can be justice in, in the minds of people, not killing each other, as easy as that. It sounds terrible uh, to just say these few words, but as a layman, I cannot say other words because I think them. Culture is the answer, education, and a fairer society. But this second thing is yes, maybe it takes a long time to adjust. Was that an answer to your question? Thank you. Yes, yes. Okay, then we can start. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is a dance. Our project commissioned a dance from a famous dance school in Sweden, led by a famous ballerina. And this is base 23, Young Kids Dance. And it was so successful when it was performed two years ago that the television made a special uh, a special edition of it. And it's too long for showing in its integrity. So maybe the technician can clock it. And we cut it after four minutes, 32 seconds. Okay. Jag föddes med segerhuva. Min kropp var täckt av hår från huvudet till knäna. Och min röst var grov. Jag såg ut som en pojke och borde varit det. Men det sköts aldrig någon prinssalut den natten. Alla fasade kungens reaktion men min far bara skrattade och sa hon blir nog slug för hon lurade oss alla. Mitt namn var Kristina. Och det här var mitt liv. Min uppfostran. Kärleken. Tron och krig. 
Min far dolde aldrig den sorg han kände varje gång han var tvungen att lämna mig. Han ledde vårt land till seger efter seger. Ända till slaget i Lützen tog honom ifrån mig. För alltid. <skratt>